For those of you that have not been with us for the first few um, sessions on Holy Roar, let me explain to you what we're doing. We are taking a book called Holy Roar that was written by a pastor and Chris Tomlin, and basically it is exploring the seven Hebrew words for worship. In the Old Testament, you will find praise and worship and those words basically used in seven, seven different contexts. And what we are doing is we're looking at each one and trying to figure out how that applies to our lives. Because here is the reality of it. We were all made to worship. We were all made to worship God. But not all of us do that. But we all worship. You worship something. Think about what's the most important thing in your life right now. That is what you worship. And God's word says, the Bible says, that we were made to worship him. So far we have looked at the hands of praise, the fools of praise, and last week we looked at the music of praise. Now, now, what we decided to do in this series was to divide it up. Since it's about worship and since it's about how to, to praise God, Pastor Jay and I decided that we would kind of tag team this. So if you don't like what I'm saying, hold on, because he's coming up in a little bit, and I'm sure it'll get much better. But the Hebrew word today that we are looking at is the word toda, T-O-W, D-A-A. And basically, this is an interesting word because it is giving praise or thanksgiving to God for things that you haven't received yet. Now, we're really good sometimes at thanking God and praising Him for things we receive because really that's what we all want, right? We want to be able to just say, okay, I know that God is my genie in a bottle, so if I rub it real just the right way, He's going to come out and give me my three wishes and everything's going to be great. And then you get what you want, and you wish you hadn't got what you want, right? That's right. That's right. That's how it is. So what we are looking at today is the idea of thanking God in advance, thanking Him with expectation for the things that we are crying out to Him for. Now, what this really has to do, as I was thinking about this this week, is how you view life. You know, a lot of people view life like this. They say, well, I'm going to hope for the best, but I'm really going to expect the worst. That's right. Right? Yeah. That, that's how most people, or a lot of people anyway, look at life. They're going to hope for the best, but I'm really going to expect the worst. Because, you know, when I fall out, when I walk out of here this, this morning or this afternoon, the sky is definitely going to fall. I'm hoping it's not, but I'm expecting it to. And that's the way it is. And so I was just thinking about this in a simple illustration. Of course, you know, I would have to have a Coke glass, right? Yes. Right. Okay, there you go. So I was just wondering. Is it half full or half empty? How many of you would say that that glass is half full? Yes. How many of you would say that glass is half empty? My guess is that most people in the world, the way they look at things, they would say it's half empty. <laughs> it always tastes better coming out of a Coke glass. I'm telling you why. There's just something about it. But the idea, no, don't say Pepsi. Don't even go there. Don't speak heresy in church. <laughs> the idea is that most people look at life with a glass half empty attitude. And what we want to explain to you today, and hopefully that you'll grasp, is that that is totally the opposite and it is contradictory to the way God wants us to view life. Now I am not talking about all this power of positive thinking and all that, that garbage that that, you know, the self-help books tell us about. I am talking to you about what the Word of God says. And the Word of God very simply says this. He is God. I am not. So get over it. 
He is in control. I am not. And as long as he is in control, you probably wonder where I keep getting this phrase from. <laughs> the wisest person I know that speaks into my life all the time, Karen, hmm. says this to me all the time. She says, remember, <coughs> things are not out of control as long as God is in control. That's right. That's right. And according to God, his word, he is always in control. There's not a day that goes by. There's not an hour that goes by. There's not a moment that, that goes by that he is not in control. But so many of us live our lives like he is not in control. We actually do. So... We have to ask ourselves, what is our view of life? Is our view of life as a follower of Jesus Christ that the glass is half empty or the glass is half full? Scripture speaks to this, and this is not even in your outline. This is free. Something God gave me later on, so didn't have time to get it in the outline. But, you know, the Bible says that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I really wonder, folks, I really wonder how many of us actually believe this. Do we really believe that all things, now I've done deep study on this. I've done deep theological look at the Greek language when the Bible says all things. Do you know what all things mean? All, all things. things. <laughs> Absolutely, positively, everything. The good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent. It all works together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. But let's be real and let's be honest. Are there not times when things happen in our life where we have to ask ourselves, is this really for good? You may be going through something right now and you're thinking, now hold on, Tim, because I'm going through something and I'm not so sure it's for good. Well, if you're a child of God and you believe that all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, you have to believe that in the ultimate end, everything is for your good. We throw around this phrase, just kind of flippantly sometimes, we say, God is good all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time, God is good. I've never heard anybody, when they're going through the roughest time you can imagine, say that phrase. It's always when things are good, God is good. So think about it. The next time you're going through something, are you willing to say, it may be something that is piercing your heart, that is that is just tearing you apart, are you able to say, God is good? Are you able to say that and believe it? And, and the, I don't mean this. I don't mean, well, I'm really going through a tough time, but, you know, I guess it's going to be okay because God is good. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's not what I'm talking about. That, that's like saying, well... You know, I realize the Rays have traded half their team away this year, but I guess it's going to be okay. <laughs> I'll stop there with that. The fact of the matter is, is that we, as followers of Christ, have to believe that all things work together for good. And so, therefore, when we worship him and we praise him and, and we go to him, we have to go with him with an expectation that he is going to answer our prayer. That he knows us, that he loves us, and that he's got a good plan for our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Now this, this verse is so misused so many times because if you actually research what the children of Israel were going through, they were not going through a good time in their history. It was really pretty bad. And yet God said to them, hold on, I've got a plan for you. It's not good right now, but in the end, it will be good. So this morning, I want us to look at three things that praise with expectation does for us as followers of Christ. Now remember I said that these seven words 
need to do something to us. What they need to do is they need to transform the way that we look at life and the way that we worship. And we have to remember that worship is not exclusively what we are doing right here. We associate worship with coming together as a body of believers, and it is worship, don't get me wrong, but this is only about 1% of what worship should be. Really, the, the bulk of our worship should be in the rest of the 99% of our lives. Do the people that see you on Monday morning see a person who worships like they may have seen you on Sunday morning? Or if they compared the two, if they put you side by side, your Sunday person and your Monday person, <laughs> would they not recognize you at all? That's right. Just the thought. That's right. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Praise with an expectation conveys trust in the goodness of God. Listen to James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift, anything that is good, comes from God. <coughs> comes from God. I love how the writer of Psalms says in, in chapter 100, verse 5, he says this. Just, just let this sink in, if you will. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Now, do not be deceived. Do not think that I think for a minute that all of life's circumstances are good. Lord knows I have lived through some things that are simply not good. If you can say amen to that, raise your hand. If you're going through something that is not good right now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm going to tell you this. Hold on to the goodness of God. Hold on to the goodness of God because the word says that his love endures forever and his faithfulness continues to all generations when we praise god with an expectation we are saying man life is tough let me rephrase that <laughs> we are saying man sometimes life stinks <laughs> amen I mean, let me, I'm going to say this one more time because that was really good preaching and I don't think you got it. <laughs> Sometimes life stinks. Amen. But God is good. Life stinks, but God is good. I think we ought to change that. Instead of God is good all the time, I think we ought to change it to life stinks, but God is good. That's right. Just saying. There you go. You can, you can, you can tweet that out. <laughs> Pastor Tim said, life stinks, but God is good. That'll be the first time anybody's ever retweeted anything I've ever posted. Some of you are saying, what's a tweet? <laughs> Number two, if you're taking notes, write this down. Praise with expectation conveys trust in advance for the salvation of God. Did you get that? The key word there, in addition to salvation, is in advance. What it's saying is that we're going to God in advance, knowing that in advance he is good and he's going to take care of the situation. That's right. He is absolutely going to take care of it. Psalm chapter 50, verses 22 and 23 says this. Now consider this, you who forget God. Okay, let's stop right there. Wake up <laughs> if you're not walking with God daily. Listen to what his word says. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. All right. A few weeks ago, we all came forward, and we placed the names of some folks on a little cross or a little heart. These are the people that we know in our lives that we are praying for. These are people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. These are people who are not walking with him daily. These are people who may at one time have had a relationship with him, but now they are not. And we challenged you to start praying for these people. 
I want to tell you how you should be praying for them. You should be praying for them with an expectation of thankfulness that God has already started to work in their lives, that God has already started to orchestrate things, that you could speak truth to them, that you can love on them, and that one day you would have the opportunity to be a part of them turning their lives over to Jesus Christ. You see, it would be totally wrong for us to pray for these people and say, Lord, bring somebody into their lives. I don't want to do it. But bring somebody into their lives that will help lead them to Jesus. We need to be saying, Lord, help me to move into their lives. And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter. It does not matter who you are or what your age is. There are people that you can work in their lives, and only you. You see, it's about the salvation of God. Listen to Psalm 56, verses 11 and 12. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me. O oh God, I will render praises to you. What God's word is saying, folks, what is it going to harm you to pray for somebody? What is it going to harm you to speak truth to someone? I had the privilege this past week of meeting with a group of college students from UT, many of them international students. And I'm going to tell you what, I am so encouraged because, because the people that say that the next generation, the millennials, are not hungry for God, you're wrong. These kids are hungry for God. And those of us that are not young, we don't need to just be sitting back saying, grumble, 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 this world is terrible. We need to be pouring our hearts and our lives into these people that they can take up the mantle of Jesus Christ when we're gone. You see, instead of just saying, wow, why is everything so terrible? How about if we do something about it? How about if we do something about it? I tell you, I think one of the, one of the worst things that, that God ever sees is, a, is when Christians do this. I want something done, but I'm just going to sit on my hands and not do a thing. If we want to see the salvation of God, we need to be a part of it. Third thing. A praise of expectation conveys trust that God is our ultimate hope. Folks, let me just tell you this. If you're putting your hope in anything else, it's the wrong place. That's right. It absolutely is just the wrong place. Right. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust, what? In the name of the Lord our God. Our hope is not in this world. If you're putting your hope in anything in this world, let me tell you, it's fleeting, and it's passing away. The book of James says that our lives are like a, a mist, like a vapor. Here today and gone tomorrow. Don't put your hope in anything but in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's right. Because that is where our eternity is. I know many of you probably have watched um, part, if not all, of the funeral service for... Uh, Reverend Billy Graham this past week. Um, I was really moved by his son when he was speaking at the funeral. Now, we all know that, that Franklin Graham is a, is a wonderful proclaimer of the gospel, and the work he does through Samaritan's Purse is amazing. But even he will say, he is no Billy Graham. But you know, something he said really, really struck me. He said, you know, the past few years were different in my father's life than all the years before. All the years before were filled with traveling, going here, traveling around the world. He said the past few years he didn't take many trips, wasn't able to. He said, but you know what? This past week he was preparing for the trip that he's been waiting his whole life for. Amen. You see, that's what we should really be doing, folks, is preparing 
for the trip of a lifetime. We all love a good trip. We all love a good vacation. But you know what? There's nothing compared to the trip that will lead us to heaven. Amen. Before Pastor Jay comes and shares a little bit of the background of the, the, the music portion of this chapter in the book, I want you to listen to the song behind this chapter. It was written by Chris Tomlin and some others. It simply is called, I Will Lift My Hand. God in praise or when we lift our hands to God it's usually one of two things we're either praising God or we're crying out to him that's right but why does it have to be one or the other why can't we praise God and shed tears of joy at the same time why is it when we cry out to God it always has to be at a low part We need to praise God all the time. We need to praise him because of the expectation that he's going to be there with us and see us through that trial when we come out on the other side. Now, I'm not saying we need to, oh, God, thank you for heaping these hot coals on top of my head. <laughs> but we need to praise God because we know that once those coals are done, he's going to brush them off and we're going to come out the other side. We're going to be a stronger person for it. In Psalm 42, verse 4, David writes, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts of song and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Once again, those worship leaders, they're out in the front. You know, I don't know what it is with them guys, but you got to love them. <laughs> Gotta love them. But even through all the trials that David went through, even through everything that happened in his life, he was able to praise God. We need to be able to do the same thing. Many of you know the story of my grandson, Jonathan. For those of you who don't, Jonathan was born four months premature. Wow. Um, my daughter was 24 weeks pregnant when she went into labor, and the doctors came into the room, and Brother Dave Curdy was there with us, and Pastor Tim was there, and the doctors asked my daughter, point blank, how much do you want us to do for this baby? And I remember it crystal clear, my daughter sat up, she raised her hand, and she said that you do as much as you can do. And my God will do the rest. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's praising God during the hard times. Mm -hmm. By the way, Jonathan turns 11 this year. <laughs> but that's praising God during the hard times. And that's what we need to be able to do. It was that expectation that God was going to see us through that situation. If we don't expect God to see us through a situation, then why are we praying to him in the first place? If we don't have that expectation. Based on this verse, Chris Tomlin and Matt Marr, they developed the chorus for the song that we just heard. I lift my hands to believe again. You are my refuge. You are my strength. As I pour out my heart, these things I remember. You are faithful God. Faithful God forever. Expecting God to bring us through the hard times, you know what it does? It shows the world that we not only talk the talk, we walk the walk. It's easy to tell somebody, you know, God's going to see, see you through tough times, and God's going to help you through this, and God's going to help you through that, when everything in our own life is doing good. But it's when we're going through the tough times, and we can share that with somebody else, and we can say, you know, God's going to bring you through this. I know everything's going to be all right. That's when in our weakness, God's strength comes out. That's right. God doesn't say that he's going to give us the ability to do everything that we need to do in our lives. 
And he doesn't ask us to. He simply asks us to be available. If we're available to praise him, then he's going to give us the opportunity to praise him. If we're available to share him, he's going to give us the opportunity to share him. But we need to have that expectation. We need to know that God's going to bring those things about. So when you pray for something, expect it to happen. And be careful what you're praying for. Because if you pray with that expectation, God's going to bring it into your life. Pastor Tim said it many times before. If you're praying for patience, God's not going to give it to you. He's going to make you go to the longest line in the grocery store and have somebody there with a stack of coupons like that, plus the ones that are on their phone. That's going to give you patience. Guarantee it. Even if you only have two items, go to the longest line and see how your patience develops. It shows that we're not just giving lip service to God, but that we truly believe in what we are saying. We truly believe in what God's Word says. And we truly believe in our faith. And in that it's going to make us stronger. We honor and glorify God because we trust in who we can't see and we trust in what we can't touch. That's right. So many times people say, well, you know, I believe this table's here because I can see it and I can touch it. But we need to be able to have the faith to see and believe and trust in the things that we can't see. We all see the effects of the wind. Right now it's blowing copious amounts of pollen everywhere. Amen. We don't know how the wind works. We're not all atmospherical scientists. It doesn't matter. We can see the effect. That's how God works in our lives. We don't have to understand why he does it. We don't have to understand how he does it. We just have to have the faith to know that he's going to do it. And to have that trust. When we have faith like that, our resolve is strengthened. We know that through God's word, we're going to be okay. I read the end of the book. Guess what? God wins. We're going to be okay. He's going to see us through it. We're purified and we walk closer to God when we have that expectation. Because we know we're going to go through trials. We know we're going to have hard times. We know we're going to have difficulties. But we also know that we're going to have good times. We're going to have great times. We're going to be able to praise God and thank Him for the blessings that He's given us. But with one comes the other. We have a deeper compassion for others who are in the same season that we are. We can go to somebody, you know what? I know what you're going through. I've been there. Now that we're on the back side of it with our grandson, I can minister to somebody who, who is going through a difficult pregnancy or who has a premature child of their own. And I've had the opportunity to do that in the past. If you're recovering from an addiction, you can minister to somebody who is in the same season. If you're struggling with depression, you're able to minister to somebody who's going through the same season. Pastor Tim and I kind of have a secret code and when Chris Tomlin wrote this song, a very good friend of his, Louis Giglio, was going through a difficult time in his life. There are times when Pastor Tim and I lean on each other because we're going through difficult times. A recent statistic shows that 50% of pastors in America deal with depression of some sort. Well, Pastor Tim and I can 
kind of look at each other and know when something's off. And we'll just simply say, I'm praying for you, Grant. Now, Grant refers to Grant Taylor in the movie Facing the Giants. And we know the struggles that he went through in his own life. But we're able to do that with each other because we know that we're praying for each other, expecting God to bring us through. We're praying for each other's family because when something affects us, it affects our family. I guarantee if you talk to Lisa or, or talk to Karen, they will tell you when something affects us, it affects them as well. But it's that expectation of knowing that it's going to be okay that helps us to begin to see the light and realize that the light at the end of the tunnel is not a fast approaching train. It's the light of God. And he's able to help us. Where does our help come from? Once again, if you turn to Psalms 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. David, just as we should, lifted his eyes and his hands up in expectations that the Lord would be there to help him. Again, if we're not expecting God to do anything from our prayers, then why offer them up? Why are we praying? If you don't expect God to minister in your life and in somebody else's life, why are we doing this? Is it to look good to our neighbors? Is it to say, oh, I'm a churchgoer? Is it to look good to our co-workers? Is it some type of, of status symbol on social media to say, hey, you know, I'm, I was tagged in church this morning. This is where I was at. So that everybody else can see. If we're not expecting God to have results, then why do we do it? But here's the thing. The results are up to God. We just need to pray. When we pray for these people in this box, and we pray for their salvation. It's not our responsibility to save them. That's God's responsibility. And I guarantee you God's going to take his responsibility seriously. But it is our responsibility to pray for these individuals. It is our responsibility to send them a letter. To give them a phone call. Send out a tweet. Send them a text message. An email. However we want to get in contact with them. Just to let them know that we're praying for them. That's our responsibility. On the song in the book, Chris Tomlin wrote, quote, says, this is a song of expectation. When I feel the dark times setting in, the pains of life, I sing this song and lift, lift my hands in expectation that the darkness will not live. God will lead me into the land of the living. He is faithful forever. Let faith arise. God's not going to leave us in the season where we're at. Whether it's good or whether it's difficult. But what God will do is he will see us through each and every situation. He will be there on the other side. And that's what's so amazing is not only is he on the other side, but he's right there with us, with an arm around us on our shoulders, just saying, I'm here with you. I'm going to help you. Those of us that have children and grandchildren, we know that sometimes we have to discipline them. And it's not easy. But there's a reason for it. The seasons that we go through in our lives, there's a reason for it. I guarantee you when we go through difficult times, it's not easy for God to see his children suffering. And for God to see his children in pain, just like we're in pain. 
when our children are suffering. But you know what? We're always there for our kids. It doesn't matter if they're 2, 22, 42, 52, whatever. We're always there for our kids. It's just God's always there for us. We just need to expect it. Expect something to happen when we pray. And keep praying until something does happen. Will you stand with us as we go to the Lord in prayer? Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. You know, I was thinking this week about a, a phrase that, that someone has shared with me many times. And it's about expectations. And this person says, when it comes to people, if you keep your expectations low, you'll never be disappointed. And that may be true when it comes to people. But folks, I want you to know that is so far from the truth when it comes to our Heavenly Father. You see, he wants us to expect him to work and to move in our lives. So in the, in the stillness of this moment, whatever's going on in your life, whatever that situation may be, it's important to you, and God wants you to know that it's important to him. So take just a second and think about that situation. And I want to pray for you. Father, you know the hearts of your people. You know what is going on in each and every life. Some things may seem not that serious to us, but to the person that it, that's going through it, it's something. So, Father, right now, with an expectation that you are going to take care of every situation, would you 